as well known all world around us is consist of from the small number of building elements, which are called atoms. The size of unusual objects around us, as this gold nugget, is about several centimeters or meters. With the help of an electronic microscope we can see molecules or atoms. The size of atoms is one million times smaller than the size of usual objects around us. It is about 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeters. The name atom comes from the Greek atomos, which means indivisible, something that cannot be divided further. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, physicists discovered the subatomic components and some structure inside the atom, thereby demonstrating that the chemical atom was divisible and that the name might not be appropriate. Now we know, that the atom is consist of from the nucleus and the number of electrons, which move around the nucleus. The size of nucleus is about one million times smaller, than the size of atom. It is about 10 to the power of minus 30 centimeters. What is the structure of the nucleus? In general the nucleus is consist of from the number of the protons and neutrons. In the most simple case of the hydrogen atom the nucleus is consist of from one proton. So, we can ask, what is the structure of the proton? In the 19th century it was found that all the variety of the matter around us is consist of from a small number of basic elements called atoms. The discovery of the table of the chemical elements by men leave allowed to find a basic fundamental building blocks, from which the world around us are built. This is the first variant of table, which was published by men leave. It has unusual form with exchanged to columns and a rows. This is the usual form of his table which was published two years later. Mendeleev arranged all known elements in table and had found, that some of cells are empty. So, he predicted some elements, which were unknown. For example, he predicted the properties of those missing elements, such as gallium and germanium, which were discovered soon. The discovery of X-rays by Rentgen showed that it is possible to see what seemed invisible by human eyes, even armed with a microscope. In fact, X-rays and a photographic plate are the same as a visible light, and are our eyes, but more powerful and more sensitive. During further investigation in this direction Bickrell discovered a new natural source of radiation. The nature of this radiation was not understanding, but the source of these rays was identified, this was uranium. Titanic work of Marie Curie allowed to find some more chemical substances, namely, two new chemical elements polonium and radium which were the sources of radiation. It took Marie Curie over three years to isolate from several tons of uranium mineral pitch blend one tenth of a gram of radium chloride. Then it was found, mostly by Rutherford, that the radiation from uranium or radium has a complicated structure. Let's take a source of radioactivity and a scintillator screen which will register a particles by means of flash. If we put the radiation into a magnetic field the radiation will split up to the three parts, which we conditionally paint into red, green and blue colors named correspondingly as alpha, beta and gamma particles. Such separation is due to well known fact, that the charged particles move along a circle inside an uniform magnetic field. The radius of circle is depend on the mass, electrical charge and velocity of the particle. So, the radiation contains the positive charged alpha rays, the negative charged beta rays and the neutral gamma rays. Moreover, as was established by Rutherford, if we place some plate between the source of radiation and the scintillator screen, the registered intensity of radiation will be changed. Namely if we take 0.0005 cm thick aluminium foil the intensity of alpha particles will be reduced to half. 
If we take 0.05 cm thick aluminium plate the intensity of beta particles will be reduced to half, while alpha particles will be absorbed completely. And if we take about 8 cm thick aluminium platen the intensity of gamma particles will be reduced to half while beta particles will be absorbed completely. In the results of these experiments the beta particles were identified with the electron, which was discovered by Thomson at the same time. Alpha particles were much more massive with compared to beta particles and had the positive charge. The mass of alpha particles were the same order as the mass of atoms. Gamma rays were identified with X-rays, on with the high energy photons. In one of the next experiment in Rutherford's laboratory, Geiger and Merston studied a deviation of alpha particles from their initial direction after passing draw for gold foil. This experiment is known as gold foil experiment, they take radium, obtained by Maria Curie, as the source of alpha particles, which were detected by the scintillation zinc sulfide screen. Then they put the gold foil and see what will changed. Of course, visually almost nothing will changed, because the number of alpha particles is very very great and this thin plate does not change anything much. However the main idea was to see whether the alpha particles are deflected at large angles from their initial direction. Geiger and Marsden had found, that about 60 alpha particles per minute are reflected to the angles larger than 90 degrees, that is in the opposite direction. Rutherford commented the result of this experiment as follows, It was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. In the beginning of 20th century the most popular model of atom was a Thompson model, who discovered the electron, or so called plum pudding model. The direct formulation of Thompson is the following. Atom can be imagined as pudding with positive charge and plums as electrons. The atoms of the elements consist of a number of negatively electrified corpuscles enclosed in a sphere of uniform positive electrification. Rutherford show, that within this model alpha particles cannot scattering on large angles. That is, alpha particles pass through atom with small deviation. To explain the results of gold foil experiment, Rutherford came to the conclusion that the positive charge in an atom is concentrated only in a small part of it. Rutherford showed that, in order to explain the experimentally observed scattering of alpha particles at angles greater than 90 degrees it is necessary to substantially reduce the size of the sphere in which positive charge of atom is situated. According to his calculations, this size is out of the order of 10 to the power of minus 30 centimeters, while the size of an atom of the order 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeters. Rutherford's model perfectly described the experimental data. However, this model gave rise to a lot of questions. Answers were obtained only after the construction of a new science, a quantum mechanics. In the middle of 20th century a lot of subatomic particles similar to proton and neutron were discovered. It seems, that by analogy with the periodic table some fundamental building blocks should exist. Different theoretical models were built, but it was necessary to look into some of these particles. Such experiment was performed by Slack MIT collaboration. The idea of this experiment was very similar to the gold foil experiment. Let's see what were changed. Let's begin with a target, or an object of investigations. In gold foil experiment it was a gold foil. In Slack MIT experiment it was changed to the cylinder, 7 centimeters, 
with liquid hydrogen. Hydrogen is consist of one proton and one electron far beyond from proton, so we have a lot of protons. As hydrogen is liquid, under very low temperature, all protons are very close to each other. Next is the source. In the gold foil experiment the source of alpha particles was very small piece of radium. Slack MIT group used the special device, which is called accelerator. It work in the following way. Let's take a glass tube and two electrodes, red and blue. Blue electrode will attach to the negative pole. Minus of battery and red electrode will attach to the positive pole. Plus of battery. If we put inside the tube the source of electrons but switch off battery the electrons will go in any way. If we switch on battery, then the electrons will be accelerated along the electrical field. To accelerate the electrons up to speed of light we should take a lot of such tubes with electrodes. So. We obtain the linear particle accelerator, which is almost 3 kilometers in long. The energy of the electrons is 40,000 times more than the energy of alpha particles used in the experiments of Rutherford. In Rutherford's experiments the scintillator plates only indicate that alpha particle passed off them. However, the position of the flash of light can be used for the determination of coordinate in which a particle cross the scintillator plate. The most effectively to do this by dividing the scintillator plate into several segments or narrow strips and attach to each strip of photoelement, which will register the flash. Then, the coordinate of a passing particle is equal to the coordinate of a flashing strip up to a width of this strip. The more narrow strip will give the more accurate result. Such device, which consists of the array of organic scintillators, is called hodosub, from the Greek hodos for way or path, and skopos an observer. Thus with the help of hodoscope we can measure the scattering angle of the particle, if you place hodoscope vertically. Moreover, we can measure in a similar way the momentum, or velocity, of a charged particles. A charged particle in a magnetic field will move on a circle. Knowing the radius of the circle as well as the charge and mass of this particle we can find its momentum or velocity. If we take an uniform magnetic field all particles will move along a circle, but if we take special magnets we can change the trajectory of particles according well known low. To determine the radius of this curve we need to measure the particle trajectory in a horizontal plane. For this purpose the second hodoscope was used which was disposed at some angle to the direction of electrons. Measuring the coordinate of a particle with the help of hodoscope, we can easily calculate the momentum, or velocity, of this particle. Now we are ready to construct slack MIT detector. It is placed on some angle under the direction of motion of electrons. One of hodoscope will measure this angle. The system of magnets will change the trajectory of electrons to find their momentum, or velocity, with the help of second hodoscope. After two hodoscopes the calorimeter was installed which absorbs each electron and measures the absorbed energy. This is a photo of detector, which was used in Slack MIT experiment. You can see people near this detector to imagine its real size, which is about 10 to 30 meters. Its weight is about 750 tons. We can compare Slack MIT detector with laboratory of Rutherford. The difference is much impressive. However, Slack MIT detector can measure scattering angle, momentum and energy. The idea of Slack MIT experiment was similar to the gold foil experiment, study a distribution of an electrical charge inside the proton. 
because the energy of the electrons from the linear accelerator is much more than the energy of alpha particles from radium in the gold foil experiment then these electrons can look inside the proton like alpha particles look inside the atom. In the gold foil experiment the number of alpha particles in some scattering angle were detected. The slack MIT experiment can measure the scattering angle, momentum and energy of the scattering particle. This gives much more information, which can be used for the analyze of the scattering process. It is not hard to compute the general formula for the numbers of particles, which will scatter into some angle and have some energy. If proton don't have any internal structure then the slack MIT collaboration should obtain a data close to the following graphic, which predict the low number of events with the higher values of transferring energy from electron to proton. But they found instead many events. There seemed to be something small and hard inside the proton, thus, it was found that the proton has an internal structure. Its consist of smaller components. By the time of the Slack MIT experiment, a scientist already had some ideas about how the proton and other subatomic particles, similar to the proton, are built. All discovered subatomic particles have a quite similar properties, that is, they have a difference only in a few internal or intrinsic characteristics. Each particle has a number of such internal properties, or quantum numbers, which uniquely characterize them and are related with the corresponding interactions. For example, the electric charge is one of such characteristic, which appear under interaction with other charged particles, on with an electric and magnetic fields. The electric charge is measured in the units of the charge of electron. It should be discrete as all other quantum numbers. Another important example is the intrinsic form of angular momentum of a particle, which called a spin of particle. As the name suggests, spin was originally conceived as the rotation of a particle around some axis, that is related with its magnetic properties. So, we can imagine the particle as sphere and spin as its own rotation. However, really, the particle is not the sphere and spin is a solely quantum mechanical phenomenon. It does not have a counterpart in a classical mechanics, so cannot be interpreted classically or in our usual point of view. The Stern girl arc experiment are usually used to demonstrate that electrons and atoms have an intrinsic angular momentum or spin. This experiment involves sending a beam of particles through an inhomogeneous magnetic field and observing their deflection. The result of experiment was rather unexpected, the particles passing through the stern girl arc apparatus are deflected either up or down by a specific amount, while they expected the random and continuous distribution. Let's imagine a particle with spin as a sphere with two magnetic poles, red for south and blue for north. Spin of particle interacts with the external magnetic field, if spin may have any value then a deviation of particles under the action of the external magnetic field will arbitrary. The Stern-Girl arc experiment showed that spin can have only two values along the external magnetic field, in the same direction or in the opposite direction, which corresponds to spin up and spin down, or, more precisely, a projection of the spin on the direction of the external magnetic field. The results of experiment showed that particles possess an intrinsic angular momentum that is closely analogous to the angular momentum of a classically spinning object, but that takes only certain quantized values. Spin of a particle is measured in the units of the spin of photon, it should be discrete, but such particle as electron, proton, neutron have the spin equal to half of unity. 
we have two particles with the spin half of unity which can imagine as a top toy in the form of a half sphere. Suppose, these two particles are identically, that is they have the same internal properties or quantum numbers. We want to put them in the same place, for example, inside the sphere. There is some fundamental principle of nature, which usually called the Pauli exclusion principle, stating that no two particles with the spin half of unity can share the same quantum state at the same time. In our demonstrative example this means, that we cannot put in the same place, inside the sphere, two identical half sphere. However, we can do this, if we flip vertically one of half sphere. In this case our state will not have the same internal properties or quantum numbers, they will differ in the direction of the spin, or, more accurate, the projection of the spin. One half sphere will correspond to the spin up, while other will correspond to the spin down. If we take a different particle, it will not feel these particles and it can share place with any of these particles. This procedure is nothing as the construction of the proton and other subatomic particles from an elementary particles, which was proposed by Gelman and Zweig in 1964. According to their idea the proton, neutron and other similar particles with half integer spin, one half, three halves and so on, called baryons, consist of three elementary particles, particles with integer spin, zero, one and so on, called mesons, consist of two elementary particles. So, that problem was the following, think out an elementary particles with some internal properties, which can be used to construct all known particles. They introduced only three particles, which was called quarks by Gelman, and constructed all know at that moment particles, not only baryons, but also mesons. How this works? Let's start with our usual particles proton and neutron. Neutron has charge zero, proton has charge plus one. Both particles have spin half of unity. So, Gelman and Zweig construct these particles from two type of quarks, U and D. All quarks have spin half of unity and to obtain the same spin for proton or neutron we should take one quarks with spin down. In this case total spin will half of unity. It is easy to calculate what electric charge should have U and D quarks. They have charge plus 2 divided by 3 and minus 1 divided by 3 in unity of the charge of electron. The charge of quark is fractional. To construct all other known baryons with half of unity spin, they introduced an additional quark, S quark. It has the same electric charge as D quark. The construction of all particles is really a mathematical game, you should put all particles on the array. Each line in the array respect to a number of the corresponding quarks. For example, the horizontal lines correspond to a different numbers of s quark, 2 s quarks, 1 s quark and 0 s quarks. An intersection point of the lines of array corresponds to some baryon, if exactly three quarks are situated in this point. So, we should consider a hexagon. All particles, which can be constructed in this way, were already known. Moreover, it is possible to find some relation between the masses of the different particles in the array, what were done by Gelman. Mathematically, it is possible to do the same for the baryons with the three half of unity spin.
we should extend the array to include the lines with three quarks. In this case all quarks will have the same direction of their spins, and according to the mathematical theory, we can construct the following states, or baryons. What is the most intriguing, that Gelman predict new particle from his completely theoretical consideration? This particle was indeed discovered with some upcoming experiment. So, this model was very pretty, but had some unusual futures. First of all, the fractional charge. Nobody did find the fractional charge in any direct experiment. Second problem was related with the Pauli exclusion principle. The particle, which was predicted by Gelman and discovered experimentally, should consist of three identical quarks. In any case two quarks will have the same quantum numbers, what is in a contradiction with the Pauli exclusion principle. To resolve this problem Greenberg suggested to introduce a new, earlier unknown, internal property, or quantum number, for quarks, which was called, color. As well known all variety of colors around us may be obtained from the three primary colors, red, green and blue, mixing in the different proportions. Taking all three colors in the same proportion we get a white color. So, each of the three quarks inside the proton, or baryon, has one from the three primary colors. Together they give a colorless proton, or baryon. Electrically charged particles may have positive or negative charges. For example, electron has the negative electric charge, while its antiparticle, positron, has the positive electric charge. Quark may have the color charges, red, green or blue. Antiquark, which has the opposite electric charge, may have the anticolor charges, anti-red, anti-green or anti-blue, which are really cyan, magenta and yellow d quark and 2u quarks with red, green and blue colors may combine into the proton, which is colorless with the electrical charge plus 1. anti d quark and 2 anti u quarks with cyan, magenta and yellow colors may combine into the antiproton, which is colorless with the electrical charge minus 1. At the moment we know, that there are six different types of quarks. Fourth type of quark is C quark or so called charm quark and its anti quark. Fifth type of quark is B quark or so called bottom or beauty quark and its anti quark. Sixth type of quark is T quark or so called top or truth quark and its anti quark. Masses of every new type of quark are much more of all previous quarks. The fact that these three colors indeed exist was confirmed experimentally by studying the processes of annihilation of electrons and positrons in the accelerators. Since the positron is the antiparticle of the electron, then in according with the quantum field theory, they will annihilate under a collision and will produce another particle antiparticle pair. This new pair may be any pair within the energy of annihilating pair. So, we can produce an electron positron pair, a quark antiquark pair, and so on. The special detectors may identify a producing pair experimentally while with the help of quantum field theory we can calculate the expected number of events depending on the type of the produced particles. The theoretical prediction can be obtained for the ratio of the cross section of the pair of particles having a color to the number of particles, which don't have color electron or very similar particle muon, which can be easily detected.
the theoretical predictions depend on the sum of the square of the charges of quarks, which can be produced and the number of colors. If we can produce first three type of quarks, U quark, D quark and S quark, we should expect that this ratio will be about 2, what is good agreement with experimental data. If the energy of annihilating pair will enough to produce a fourth quark, which called as charm or C quark, and its antiquark the expected value of ratio will slightly less than experimental data, however for this case large corrections should take into account. If the energy of annihilating pair will enough to produce a fifth quark, which called as beauty or B quark, and its antiquark the expected value of ratio will in a nice agreement with experimental data. In electromagnetic interactions electrically charged particles, such as electron and positron, exchange photons, the carriers of the electromagnetic force. Since the color is a fundamental property of elementary particles quarks, then this property must appear at some interaction with another object that has the same property. This interaction has been called the color interaction and the theory that describes such interaction is called the quantum chromodynamics, by analogy with the theory of electromagnetism, the quantum electrodynamics. In color interactions the quarks exchange gluons, the carriers of the color force. Gluons, like photons, are massless particles with a whole unit of intrinsic spin. However, unlike photons, which are not electrically charged and therefore do not feel the electromagnetic force, gluons carry color which means that they do feel the strong force and can interact among themselves. Usually, the color force is called as a strong force. Strong force is one of the four fundamental interaction of nature that acts between subatomic particles of matter. At atomic scale, it is about 100 times stronger than electromagnetism, which in turn is orders of magnitude stronger than the weak force interaction and gravitation. Let's look at the color force closer. As we know, quarks carry three types of color charge, red, green and blue. Antiquarks carry three types of anticolor, cyan, magenta and yellow. Gluons carry both color and anticolors. There are six color mixing gluons and three colorless gluons as they carry color and its anticolor. Some of mixing gluons form gluon anti gluon pairs. According to quantum chromodynamics, three colorless gluons should combine into two states. So, there are the eight gluons at all which carry the color charge between quarks or gluons themselves. How this works? Let's look inside some baryon, for example proton, which consists of three quarks with different colors, red, green and blue. Green quarks may emit green-yellow gluon and becomes blue. Green-yellow gluon may be absorbed by blue quarks and it becomes green. There are a lot of such possibilities. Important, that at each moment the whole system quarks and gluons should be colorless. In principle, quark may emit colorless gluon. In this case quark will not change color, as colorless gluon is a superposition or a mixing state of all colorless gluons. It can convert to other colorless gluon. Such gluon will not change the color of quark, which absorbs it. Moreover, gluons may interact among themselves and may be transformed into a new gluons.
one can easily extend this procedure to another possibilities take into account a different self interactions of gluons. The strong force similar to a spring. In that as you stretch a spring, it gets harder and harder to stretch it more. When a spring is stretched beyond the elastic limit, it breaks to produce two springs. In the case of the quark bear, a new quark antiquark pair will be created when pulled beyond certain distance. Part of the stretching energy goes into the creation of the new bear, as a consequence, one cannot have quarks as free particles. We can't see an isolated quark because the color force does not let them go, and the energy required to separate them produces quark antiquark pairs long before they are far enough apart to observe separately. This phenomenon is known as color confinement. Quarks never appear in isolation. The quark model works very well and it perfectly describes an experimental data and even predicts a new subatomic particles. But this model was static. That is it did not include any information how an elementary particles move inside the proton and how they interact to each other. Such description became available in the framework of the so-called part model, proposed by Richard Feynman in 1968. In according with this model the proton is built from some constituents, which were called by Feynman as a partons. Each parton inside the given proton carries out some part, or fraction, of its momentum, its electric charge, its spin and so on. In principle, the number of such partons inside the proton is not restricted, that is, it is arbitrary. When an electron or other elementary particle collides with the proton, it interacts with these partons. In general, at this moment, we cannot calculate exactly the result of such interaction because the elementary particles are not in elastic spheres. They are a complicated objects, which have an electric charge, a spin, a mass and so on, that is, they interact by means of all four fundamental interactions. To find the result of such collision we should take into account all these interactions, which is very complicated task. However, a quantum field theory gives us a possibility to evaluate the result with a high precision, which is compatible with the precision of the corresponding experiment, that is, the precision of the experiments and the precision of the theoretical computations are of the same order. According to the quantum field theory in the collision between the electron and the parton, the particles affect each other through exchange of a so-called virtual particles, which for this process is a light quantum or a virtual photon. The exchange with one virtual photon will give main contribution to the result of the interaction. To improve the obtained result we should take into account more virtual particles, but in many cases this is not necessary. The virtual photon carries energy, which is transferred from one colliding particle to another colliding particle during their interaction. Usually, a physicist consider the virtual photon separately from the parent electron. This allows to make an analogy with a microscope. In both cases we used the photon to study the object of investigations. The more powerful photon, with a lesser wavelength, can resolve the smallest objects, 
As we learn from Rutherford's and Slack MIT experiments to study the detailed structure of the proton we should increase the energy of the particles, which will interact with the protons. To study the structure of the atom, Rutherford used an alpha particles with the energy 5 mega electron volts from an radium. To study the structure of the proton, the Slack MIT experiment used the electrons with the energy 20 giga electron volts from a linear accelerator. To increase the energy of the interaction we should either enlarge the length of accelerator, either improve the acceleration in an individual cell, However we can unite two accelerators and collide the accelerated particles. Such scientific device and very large and very complicated engineering construction is usually called a collider. Usually, the collider is consist of two charged particle accelerators in the form of rings, situated in the same tunnel under the ground. The charged particles are accelerated in the opposite directions, so they are collided in some interacting point. To investigate the structure of proton with the collider a special scientific center was built in Hamburg. This center is known as DESI, Deutsche Elektron Synchrotron. Main device of DESI is HERA, Hadron Electron Ring Accelerator. DESI's largest synchrotron and storage ring, with a circumference of 6,336 meters. Hera's tunnel runs 10 to 25 meters below ground level. Two circular particle accelerators run inside the tube. One accelerated the electrons to energies of 27.5 giga electron volts. The other accelerated the protons to energies of 920 giga electron volts in the opposite direction. Both beams completed their circle nearly at the speed of light, making approximately 47,000 revolutions per second. At four places of the ring the electron and the proton beam could be brought to collision. In the process. Electrons are scattered at the constituents of the protons, the partons or quarks and gluons. The collision between the electron and the proton will destroy the initial proton and will produce a lot of subatomic particles. Such process, which was studied at DESI, is usually called as a deep inelastic scattering. In the elastic scattering all kinetic energy of an interacting objects are the same before and after collision. The inelastic scattering means, that the part of the kinetic energy is transmitted to other kind of energy, for example, to destroy the second object. The products of these particle collisions, the scattered lepton and the quarks, which are produced by the fragmentation of the proton, were registered in a huge detectors. In the North Hall the H1 detector was constructed and in the South Hall the Zeus detector was installed. Both detectors have a special cylindrical form along the ring of accelerator, such the interaction point are situated in the center of detector, what allow to obtain the maximally possible information about a collision, as sub-detectors are situated around the interaction point as a concentric cylindrical layers. At HERA, it was possible to study the structure of protons up to 30 times more accurately than before. The resolution covered structures one thousandth of the proton in size. This picture present one of the most important result from the investigation of the deep inelastic scattering processes, this is the part and distribution function of the proton. Variable x means the size, which we can resolve inside the proton, from the beginning we do not see anything inside the proton, that is we see the proton as a whole object and the electron is scattered on the proton as in Rutherford's experiment. 
increasing the energy of the colliding particles we decrease the size, which we can resolve, that is we increase the magnification of our microscope. Now, the virtual photon, which responsible on the interaction between the electron and the proton, has a small wavelength and it can penetrate into the proton. Then, we have found two u quarks and one d quark, which build the proton in the framework of the quark model. These quarks, which respect to the properties of the subatomic particles according the quark model are called valence quarks. The scattering in this case can be imagined as follows. We have the proton, which consists of three quarks with the different colors. These quarks define the properties of the proton as the subatomic particle. The virtual photon absorbs by one quark. The quark obtains the energy from the virtual photon and try go out from the proton. This produce an quark antiquark pair through a breaking of a string. The interacting quark and the antiquark from the quark antiquark pair will form a new subatomic particle, meson, while the quark from the quark antiquark pair will stay inside the proton and will replace the interacting quark. But if we will increase the resolution further, we have found a lots of other quarks and a lots of gluons, this due to any two charged particles electrically charged or color charged, produce a lot of virtual particles during their interactions. So, the valence quarks swim in the sea from the virtual quarks and gluons, which are continuously produced and annihilated inside the proton. If the energy of photon will large, it will interact with the sea quarks and gluons, the scattering with the C quark can be imagined as follows. The three valence quarks of the proton swim in the C from the virtual quarks. As the number of the C quarks is more than the valence quarks, the virtual photon mostly will be absorbed by the C quark. Quark obtains the energy from the virtual photon and try go out from the proton. This produce the quark antiquark pair through the breaking of the string. The interacting quark and the antiquark from the quark antiquark pair will form a new meson, while the quark from the quark antiquark pair will stay inside the proton and will replace the interacting quark. The number of gluons, which can be found inside the proton, is increased very fast with the increasing of the resolution. While for U quarks and D quarks the situation are opposite. The scattering with the gluon can be imagined as follows. The three valence quarks of the proton swim in the sea from the virtual quarks and the virtual gluons. The virtual photon can interact only with the electrically charged particle, that is only with the quark. So, the virtual photon absorbs by the C quark. Quark obtains the energy from the virtual photon and try go out from the proton. But as the number of the gluons is much more with compared to quarks, this quark will interact immediately with the gluon, and will transmit all its energy to this gluon. Now, gluon try go out from the proton but it connects with some quarks by means of the string. The breaking of this string produces the quark-antiquark pairs. One quark and one antiquark from these pairs will form a new meson, while other quark and antiquark will stay inside the proton. The proton is a very complicated object. However, the investigation of the deep inelastic scattering at DESI provides us with a valuable information about the structure of the proton through the parton distribution function. We know with the high precision how the different elementary particles, quarks and gluons, are arranged inside the proton according their fundamental properties.
This information is used for the descriptions of the events on the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where protons are collided with the very high energy. Because we know the structure of the proton, we know what we should expect from such collisions. We can make a lot of predictions. In particular, we can calculate how a Higgs particles will born. In spite of we know a lot of information about the structure of the proton and all other subatomic particles, we still have a lot of unresolved problems and puzzles. Among them are the confinement, the proton spin puzzle, the existence of exotic hadrons such as pentaquark and glue ball, and the study of the quark gluon plasma. It is possible that somebody from the audience will make a discovery in these investigations.